Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. Today, we're going to go ahead and jump right back into our series uh, we've been covering for the last few weeks. It's called The Reason for the Season. The scripture that we're taking a look at, and it, it's actually, we're, we're diving through uh, a number of scriptures, but they're all themed around one scripture, and that's uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 14, where the Bible says, uh, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, and I would hear from heaven and I would heal their land. And, and today we're taking a look at what does it mean to turn from your wicked ways? I know, such a popular subject, right? But it is a very important one. Because uh, we do know uh, one thing about God for sure, and that's that he's holy. And so uh, when we think about our lives being uh, the way they are and, and him being holy, it seems like an impossible, uh, approachable God. Uh, but as we're going to see today, how do we turn from those wicked ways so that we could see revival in our life? Well, we're going to find that in Romans 6. I want to take you there uh, today and just kind of dive in and see um, that there is a way that we can turn from our wicked ways. And, and before we even start, I want to I want to at least let you know this up front. Um, I know that there's a lot of people out there that will fill a few categories of, of individuals. And one I'm worried about in particular is the person that would turn off this button right now, this, this video. Why? Because you might think to yourself, I've tried this before. <clears throat> I have tried to follow Jesus. Uh, I've tried to go to a church. I've tried to do the list of rules they asked me to do and don't do. And, and uh, the things that, you know, I read my Bible. And I, and I did all the things that I was told was necessary to have a, a changed life. And it didn't work. I want you to... Um, for a moment, just for a moment, set aside that past experience. Because I do believe that there, this series is being shown mostly in the Pacific Northwest of the US. And uh, if you live there, I would just say there are a lot of theological uh, schools up here. There's a lot of churches up here. Um, but as long as I've been up here for uh, Basically, a total of five years, but the last three years that I've been here, I got to say, it's very rare to hear about um, the work of the Holy Spirit on your behalf. Not you trying to chase your tail and, and figure it out and make it happen. That's pulling up your bootstraps and, and you know, you making yourself holy before God. That's that's not what we're going to cover today. So if you're in that category, hang in there. You'll see this is different than maybe what you've experienced in the past in church. So let's dive in. Um, the one common thing you're going to notice is that I use the, the scriptures. So if you want to turn to Romans 6 and follow along, you can. <coughs> and that's going to start in Romans 6 verse 1. It says this. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. In, that, <clears throat> in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For we have been unified with him 
in the likeness of his death. We will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Sound good? To have sin in your life be powerless over you. Well, that's what it says Christ did in your life. Let's go on and see what he says after that. Since a person who has died is free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too, consider yourselves. Remember that moment right here, consider. Remember that word, consider. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, in here, we see that Paul wrote Romans, and Paul's a guy who, uh, as I've mentioned before, he's kind of a, a, a definitely a hard guy to deal with. He's he's a type A personality. This guy is uh, is a hundred percent, no matter what he does, and so. He's telling us here that uh, you don't want to go on sinning as a Christian to bring about um, a spotlight on grace. That's, that's not uh, God's heart. That's not his will. He's actually uh, designed the whole uh, salvation thing so that not only are you saved, but that you're also set free from the bondage of sin. And he, he calls it slavery here. It's a hot topic tonight, or in these days, I should say. Uh, the truth is, is that we are slaves to something, every one of us, whether it be, um, you know, uh, your career, uh, your kids, maybe your wife or your husband, your spouse. Maybe there's um, something else in your life that you're a slave to, alcohol, drugs, um, pornography, whatever it may be. Here's the thing. We're all going to be slaves to something. And what I mean by that is, is that you don't have control. Is that something else has control over you. You want to give it up, but you can't. You've tried and you've tried and you've tried. And that's the testimony for a lot of people is that, man, I've tried and I always end up back at it. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is he said that he rendered sin powerless over you and I. When, when we were <clears throat> baptized into his death and then uh, raised again, right? But, but that's a one moment like kind of scenario, right? Being baptized. I mean, we all know that uh, the baptism um, of a believer, when they come into faith, they, they go into a water tank and they dunk them and they bring them back out. And, and it's representative of a, of a death of the old life and a, and a rebirth, a new life uh, going forward. But did you notice that he said consider? In there, he said, consider the old life dead. That word, consider, actually in the Greek is logizomai. And logizomai actually means to render or to count. Um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an accounting term. It's like credit, right? It's saying, hey, uh, credit your count, your reckon, your life is dead. Consider it dead. It's done. The old life. <clears throat> the... Uh, the way that we can do that oftentimes is, is letting go of the past and, and letting go of, of some of the things that we oftentimes uh, find attractive, right? I mean, let's face it, you wouldn't be in those sins if they didn't attract you in the first place. I've been in uh, you know areas of my life and seasons of my life where I was in sin, and it wasn't because I didn't like it at first, at least at first. I really enjoyed it. It was 
pleasurable. The Bible says that that's the case, is that sin is pleasurable for a season, for a season, right? But then all of a sudden, it takes hold of you. Like you're in control in the beginning, and then all of a sudden, it grabs hold of you, and, and you can't let go, and it won't let go, and now you're stuck. And then it starts to wreak havoc on your life. Maybe that's where you're at today. I'd like to offer you a different way. Now, how do you get out of something that you're trapped in like that? Well, he says to consider, to reckon. But, but you got to, I, I like to say it this way. You can't take something out without putting something back in. You got to have a replacement, right? And so what is that replacement going to be? A lot of people go from uh, drug addiction because they have addictive nature, right? And all of a sudden, I have a, a, an ex-worker that used to work for me. And, and this guy used to be hardcore cocaine addict early in the, in the 80s and 90s. And, and when he got freed from that, what he did is he replaced it with something. He replaced it with working out. So now, dude's massive and he's just uh, uh, gotten a, a different addiction, right? But the Bible said that he came that we might be free, set free. We would experience freedom. Can you imagine that? You're actually um, not having something control your life and destroy it. Well, the way that we do that was we, we put something back in, right? And so, so what do you do in uh, in Philippians four, verse eight? Let's take a look at that. Philippians four, verse eight. It says this. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Before I go any further, that word dwell, that's also logizomai, consider, count. So instead of um, the death that you had uh, cling to in, in sin, by the way, sin just means missing the mark of perfection. He says to consider or to count all these things. So if you're going to take these things out that you've been considering in your life, your thought life is constantly on a sin, you want to fill it with this. You want to Think about these things that he says. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. So he wants us to dwell on something new. Something uh, that's actually worth dwelling on. So in verse 16 of Romans, we see something that is very important to this as you just go down a little bit further in romans in verse 16 he said do you not know that if you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves you are slaves of the one you obey either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness so he's saying that whatever we do is we give our energy, our effort, our, our thought life, our, um, our everything. If whatever we give ourselves to, we're going to become slave to that. So we can either give our thought life and uh, you might say our heart and our mind are kind of the engine of where we end up, right? It's, it's going to drive where we go. So my thought life needs to be given to something new, not to the things that I once thought about or cared about, right? I know it's easier said than done, right? But at least that's what we think, or that's what the enemy wants us to think. Because at the end of the day, we kind of get tripped up or we trip ourselves up. There's three enemies of our life, right? It's the flesh, our own flesh, the devil, and the world kind of society, the way that the world is bent, right? Because you're going to have to go against the world at some point, um, or at least the flow of its sin for you to live a new life. Those three things push hard against you. You know, there's kind of a common concept 
of what I'm talking about. A lot of people talk about The Secret. Oprah promoted it for a while and it's a book. Um, it's kind of a, a theory about how, so as a man thinketh, so shall he be. Maybe you've heard that before. You might even think it's biblical. Here's the thing is that a lot of people take that concept and what they do is they make themselves God. So, so as I think, so shall I be, right? Whatever I put my mind to, that's what I'm going to become. And, you know, they talk about energy and force. And there's this uh, lady that I, I ran across at work and she was talking about this group called the Life Force Life Force Theory and uh, a group of people that um, kind of do the same thing. They, they got a lot of other wacky stuff uh, going on, but at the same token, um, there are people out there um, that believe that as they think, they that's what they're going to become. If I'm going to be a millionaire, well, I got to think that thing into existence. Well, First off, I've asked one of those people before, well then why wouldn't I just think about the lotto numbers and uh, attract those by those and that energy? But of course that's, they always say not how it works. But nonetheless, so there's this thought process that the Lord does say that we're supposed to think on these things. So he gives us a subject matter to actually put into our heart, put into our mind, right? And as we think about the things that God has planned for us and, and we think about, you know, um, what God has said, basically in his word and his promises and uh, the good that he wants to do in our life. Uh, what happens is now we're, we're filling our hearts and our minds with something that's positive, that's pointing us in the direction of, uh, of the course of life in which God designed us for. And the thing is, is that as we start to, to do that, we're thinking about these things, we're, we're submitting our hearts to God, but we really don't have within us a strength, the strength or the power really to turn. So where does that power come from? Is it from me or is it some force? It's neither. It's from God. You see, a lot of people believe that salvation is um, God's work and then sanctification is our work. But I would say that um, both, and the Bible actually most importantly would say, both are done by God. You see, the Holy Spirit is actually the person that God left behind. I, I talked about that in the last video about how um, the Holy Spirit, when the veil was ripped in the temple on the day of Christ's death, that moment, it says this, he gave up his spirit and the spirit went out. Well, it went out for a reason. It went out because God in, intended on leaving behind part of him and that was going to be imparted into you and I as believers. So now he says that he's imparted that into me, his spirit. And, and we saw that he describes his spirit as power. That word in the Greek is dunamos. Same root word we get dynamite or dynamic from. It's power. It's not just any power. It's a, it's a dynamic power. And so when we see this in the scriptures, uh, I'd like to draw our attention to it. And so why don't we take a quick look over at Acts 1, 4 through 8. Acts 1, 4 through 8. It gives a little bit more clear picture of what we're talking about. And says... In verse 4, while he was with them, Jesus that is, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. Which he said, you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So, he says that... His disciples were ready to go do mission work. They had, they had been given the command to go out and make disciples of all nations. But he said, wait, don't do it yet. You don't have what it takes yet. You need power. And that power is going to come from my promise, the promise of the Father. And it says that 
Yeah, just like the baptism of John, you're going to be baptized differently. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So why is that important? That he used that language, that baptism, right? He used the baptism of water, and then he used another image, a baptism of of the Holy Spirit, and that's a baptism of fire. And there's a lot of groups out there that have uh, taken this and gone really south or really sideways with it. Um, I would just clearly say that the Bible should, we shouldn't add to the Bible, we shouldn't subtract from the Bible, we should just read the Bible and let it uh, just speak for itself. But he does say that the power is going to come from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what is that? That's essentially um, another impartation of Jesus dwelling and living within you. His power. You know, all that he did when he was here, all the miracles, all the, all the things that he does. That's actually um, a power given by the Holy Spirit. Now, are those things super important? Maybe at times um, there was a, a time where those things were super important. Are they important today? Yeah, they may be. But God does say that the power of salvation is in the gospel. And so we don't discard miraculous works, but we don't need to chase them either because there is power in the gospel. That's in Romans as well. And so, but we do need to make sure that we have what we need to walk as a Christian and live a new life, to put to death my flesh or to turn from my wicked ways so that I can actually experience revival. So, you do have a part. I like to put it this way. You have some knobs on your side and God has some knobs on his side. Okay, you can only do certain things and he's got the rest of the job. So what are your end? It's consider. Feed the right part of your heart and mind with the right things, right? You can choose what to feed your, your mind and your heart. You can choose to either feed the flesh or you could choose to feed the spirit. You can choose to feed um, or you could choose to turn over your struggles to Jesus and say, Lord, I, I don't have the strength to stop doing this or that, or I don't have the strength to uh, stop seeing this gal at work or thinking about this person in a certain way, or um, I can't get over the bitterness. I can't get past these drugs. Um, I can't get over this fear. You can do that. Turn it over to him, and you can. That's that's one part of the knobs on your side. You can verbally and consciously make a decision of saying, "I want you, Jesus, over these things," but I'm powerless. And then you can ask him to send your the, his Holy Spirit into your life, and and that it would be a power to transform you, and that he would take over in this area. You know, that, that this area of your life that you're powerless, that he would show himself as powerful. He also says in his scriptures that where your greatest weakness is, is where he can show his strength. It's an invitation to see how strong he is, to see if he's legit. You know, I, I get every once in a while a troll on, the, on these videos. They'll follow and they'll make crappy comments or whatever. One recently said, uh, man, this superstition stuff is garbage. Well, I want to share with you a personal story of my own in this area. I was uh, 29 years old, a week away from being 30, and it's on a career path, you know, and I was doing pretty good. I had pretty much a six-figure income, um, sponsored skateboarder. I was uh, working full-time for one of the largest companies also in the um, – in the world for the, my industry, I um, <laughs> I was doing at the same time uh, thirty six hundred dollars worth of drugs a month. My wife and I uh, counted it up at one point, and uh, 
And then I was also doing about a thousand dollars worth of alcohol every weekend, uh, just partying, but also just hiding from reality. You don't do that much drugs and that much alcohol when you're happy and you're just celebrating. That is someone trying to uh, escape reality. I had the world by the, you know, um, I had everything that the world said you should um, gain if you're, if you're going after it. But I was not satisfied. I was not happy. I had no joy. I had no peace. However, I was mad because I had been raised uh, from 13 years uh, old. I had been brought and introduced into uh, Calvary Chapel down in Costa Mesa where Greg Laurie on Monday nights was teaching uh, and, and I had received Christ and I knew uh, about God. And But I was frustrated because I, I wasn't quite where they talked about. I, I had heard it all, but I hadn't experienced any of it. And so what I wanted to do was uh, so badly be right with God. And I just couldn't do it. I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried. And every time I needed to hide my feelings, my emotions, my hurts, my pains, my my habits, my hangups. But what ended up happening was ironic because I threw my fists up at God one day and I literally cussed him out. I had one finger up on both hands and it wasn't your number one. I was flipping him off. I, I was pissed. And I was telling him, leave me alone. Let me go. And the reason why I said, because I can't measure up. I can't do it. I can't clean my life up. Leave me alone. It was that very day where I heard the Holy Spirit's voice for the very first time. And he said, that's what I've been waiting for. For you to realize that you can't do it. Now let me show you my strength. And I'm not joking, that day, I quit using all those drugs, all the alcohol. And as a bonus, he threw in, uh, he, I stopped smoking cigarettes. I was smoking about a pack a half a day and, I, I, you know, the drugs and the alcohol, all of it. I lost the desire for those things that day. Started going back to a church and, you know, it was a process along the way, learning and growing, but uh, he freed me. In my weakest moment where I couldn't do a damn thing, he freed me. That offer is here for you today. If you're struggling with something, if you you got something in your life that you can't beat, man, and, and you just, you're not proud of it, you're not happy about it, you wish you could be free. Well, you know, I, I want to put it this way. I have a truck. It's got 300,000 miles on it. The thing's dead. It just died recently. I can't drive it anymore. But my wife has a car, and so I've been using hers. And, and here's what's funny. If I want to go somewhere today, I'm not going to go hop in my old truck. Now, I could sit in it, and I could go down memory lane, but it ain't going to take me anywhere. So if I want to go somewhere... I got to get in my new vehicle, my wife's vehicle. Got to get in something different, right? To get somewhere. That old truck, it's its just going to take me down memory lane. It's going to take me to the same places I've always been. Uh, but other than that, uh, driving, I ain't going anywhere. Spinning my wheels, so to speak, right? Are you going where you want? Are you on a road or path to what you want? You know, that turn from your wicked ways. Do you know that that's also translated? Um, wicked ways would be uh, evil road. Are you on an evil road? Are you on a road that, that it just seems endless? It's not working for you. How do you turn from your wicked ways? Invite the person and the work of the Holy Spirit into your life. Ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that you would have the power, the dunamis, the dynamite power within you to change. It's, and it's not your power, it's his power. It's a person, literally, living within you, dwelling as you receive Christ.
I'd like to invite you to receive that. I'd also like you to, to know that as you lean back on your old ways, it will be a hindrance. I need you to know that up front. So if you think that you can have your cake and eat it too, it usually doesn't work that way. However, the beauty is God does have a lot of grace and there is a process in this whole thing. I know I just shared a story how God took everything away in a moment, right? And he may do that for one of you guys or two or 20. Who knows? All of you. There are times where he needs to do that because there's just no way out. Then there's other things in your life that uh, maybe he's going to work out over time. He's going to have conviction in the heart. He's going to work some things out. Um, he's done that in my life as well. So it's not always just in a glimpse of a moment, boom, it's done. But could be. And I'd hate for you to pass up that opportunity. So I'd like to pray for you and invite you. If you want to see revival in your own life and maybe in your community, maybe in your state, I'm praying for the Pacific Northwest. I'm, that's what I'm praying for is the revival of the Pacific Northwest. If you want that, it's going to start with a revival, a revival of your own heart. That's going to come from saying, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want you to place your spirit within me and to baptize me with the power that I need to live the life that you want me to live. Now the rest is on God's side. He's got those knobs. He'll do the rest. So let me pray for you guys. Stay tuned next week. We're going to be covering another portion of this. But let me pray and close out. Lord, I ask for my brothers and sisters that will watch this, Lord, that you would lead them to freedom, that you would send your Holy Spirit, Lord, and baptize them with the power to live a new life, to live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. In this crazy world, Lord, there's so much going on and there's so many distractions. I pray that you would slow down their heart, slow down their mind in this moment and help them to receive you, to hear your voice, to be led by you. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters that will receive Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just made that decision, I'd love for you to drop a comment so that I can be praying for you. And uh, I'd love to also point you to some resources that would help you in your uh, growth, in your new journey, your new walk, your new direction. Hope to see you guys next week.